Amen. You can have a seat. Uh, so excited for today. We are again in uh, the Hebrew series. Week four uh, is what we're in today. Uh, so the two things that I'm asking, um, basically the, throughout the duration of summer, is that you would be diligent in bringing um, not only your Bible, but a notebook as well. Uh, I think it's important for you to bring Bible and notebook all summer long. The goal of this summer series isn't only just to go through the book of Hebrews, uh, but to teach you practically how to go through your Bible. So it's kind of twofold. One, uh, it gives us a message to kind of go through throughout the summer, uh, but also what I'm really trying to hit is some helpful tools and tricks uh, to help you read the Bible for yourself. So today we'll be in Hebrews chapter four, uh, so make sure that all summer long you bring your Bible, you bring in a notebook. Uh, and today I'm actually going to give you a little insider peek on what it looks like to study uh, Scripture. I've got some uh, notes here that I have for you, so it'll be interactive today. Uh, so. It'll be a little different than a normal Sunday. Uh, I'll actually be taking some notes and walking through with you. Uh, so I'll be able to write you squiggly faces or anything like that. So if you text me, don't text me, or everybody else is going to see what you're saying uh, today. So uh, really excited about this. And, and kind of the idea is just so I can help you see how I'm studying the Bible. I've been studying intensely the Bible and, and preaching for, uh, it's crazy, almost a decade now, a little over a decade. Uh, and I want to help you figure out how to study the Bible for yourself. I think it's the greatest tool that I can give you as a pastor. Uh, but before we get into the message today, what I would like to do is just take a moment and celebrate all the fathers that are in the room. Church, let's put our hands together for all the dads that are here. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. I believe the role of a father is, is extremely important. So just want to celebrate you uh, today. Also just want to take a moment and just uh, acknowledge today might be a tough day for some people that are in some people that are in the room relationship with dad is not great, or maybe there's some distance there, or maybe too, you're experiencing the loss of a father. Um, I know your pain as well. My father passed a few years ago, so uh, this may be your first, or maybe uh, you've been doing this for years, and it's just another reminder of dad and who he was to you and to everybody else. So I just want to take a moment and just sympathize with you and give you some empathy uh, and let you know that we have a great heavenly father, and that's going to be our prayer for you today is that you'll find comfort in him. So just want to celebrate. The Bible says celebrate with those who want to celebrate and can celebrate, but also mourn with those who mourn as well. And today might be one of those days. So I just want to take a moment and just pray for you as a church, and then we'll dive into God's word together. So Father, we come to you today, this morning, and Lord, we just thank you for the role of a father. God, thank you that Jesus came to reveal the father to us and that you are the greatest epitome of what a father looks like, that you are the beautiful reflection of what we should embody as fathers, that you're sacrificial, that you're giving, that you're kind, that you're tender, you're full of mercy and full of grace and full of truth. And Father, we pray for all the fathers that are here today that you would equip them and strengthen them and give them every tool that they need as they're surrendering their lives to your headship, that you would teach them how to be a model of what it looks like to be a father. And for the father that's here that's wrestling with not being enough, just pray, Lord, that you would encourage them today. And Lord, for those of us who are in the room that maybe experienced a loss of dad, uh, maybe for the first time, or maybe this is a couple years, or uh, maybe even longer than that, just pray for your comfort today. Uh, Lord, knowing that to be absent from body if we're in crisis, to be present with you. And Father, we just pray that you would give us great comfort, Lord, uh, to those who are mourning today uh, as a great reflection of who dad was. Lord, we just give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise today in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. So if you've got your Bibles, again, Hebrews chapter four, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a personal Bible study in front of you. So I'm going to show you what I underline. I'm going to show you what I highlight. I'm going to show you all my scribbles. And I'll just tell you right now, there's a special place for you if you're making fun of my handwriting today, uh, and it is not with donuts for dad. Uh, so don't be talking about my handwriting, okay? That's none of your business. Uh, but I'm going to show you what I do, my scribbles, all of that stuff. And the goal of this is to help you uh, really start to read the Bible for yourself. I think that's the greatest tool that I can give you as a pastor. My, the number one thing that I can do is equip you to read the word of God for yourself. Why? Because if I can equip you to read the word of God for yourself, you can hear from God every day. And how many of you realize your life would look different if you heard from God every single day? And God speaks to us every day through his word. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, Hebrews chapter four, starting at verse one. Therefore, and remember, what do we do anytime that there's a therefore? We want to circle it, underline it, highlight it, and we want to remember what is it there for. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Let's pray. Father, we come to your word today humbly, and we ask, Lord, that your word is inspired 
It's an errant, it's authoritative. We ask, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would reveal your word to us as hearers of your word. As James says, let us, let us not only be hearers of your word, but doers as well. Lord, that your word would be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Show us the direction that we should go and equip us to walk in it. We pray today as we open up your word, Lord, that it would encourage and correct and rebuke some of us that are in the room. Uh, Lord, that you would train us, that you would grow us up and mature us in your word. And for those that may be here that do not have a relationship with Jesus, we pray that, full the, that from the foolishness of preaching that you would draw them into a relationship with Jesus. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. So when I'm approaching Hebrews chapter four and I see a therefore, again, as a, as a Bible student, I want to know what is that therefore, therefore. So I'm thinking about everything that we've talked about so far in Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter one, uh, you'll see the theme throughout the entire book. Some of the more prominent words in the book of Hebrews is the word greater, the word superior, the word more excellent. So these, these are words that the writer is choosing to use to describe who Jesus is. And, re, and remember, the author of this letter is writing to people of Hebrew faith, the Hebrew nation or the Jewish people. So these are people who have an established covenant relationship with God, but now Jesus, who would be the prophesied Messiah, has came, and now they have relationship with God based through a relationship in Jesus and not by their works. So the writer is trying to talk to a works-based culture, people who are rooted in religion. They know rules, regulations. They know ceremonies and cleansing. This is where they come from. So the writer is trying to, to plead with them them on the person of who Jesus is and how we can now have this new established relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. Therefore, he's saying in verse one, Jesus is greater than angels. He's not equivalent to, he's not lower than, he is greater than the angels. Then he goes on in chapter two and three, and he talks about even Moses. He talks about Moses. He talks about Abraham. So he talks about all of these characters that are in Scripture in the Old Testament that the Hebrew people would be really familiar with. And if you've read the Bible, you've read the Old Testament, you know these characters. And what the writer is saying is these people compared to Jesus, no comparison. Jesus is beyond them. And then we read in last chapter in, in Hebrews chapter 3, the writer begins to talk about or really kind of plead with the audience that there's this idea of a rest that is available to us as believers. He's talking to the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, talking to them about rest that they would be familiarized with because they know that God rested. They would know the ceremony and, and the religious duty of taking a Sabbath. So they would know that from a religious stance. But talking about this idea of a rest and that there's a rest out there that God has for us even as believers. So therefore, while the promise of entering his rest, notice what it does, it still stands. His rest still stands. So I, I'm going to circle this word rest, and I'm going to circle failed to reach it. Because those are two things that stand out to me. This idea of rest and then failing, failing to reach it. How many of you, if God has a rest for you, you, you don't want to fail in reaching that? So as I'm studying, what I'll do is I'll look at that word rest, and I'll give you a cheat sheet right here. So you can go to this website. It's free and available to anybody. It's um, blueletterbible.com, I think, .org, blueletterbible.org. So what I'll do is I'll go to this free website that's available to you and I. You can go on there. It's just on the internet. And what I'll do is I'll look here, Hebrews chapter 1. Therefore, okay, so there it is again in the same translation. I'll press that and look here. It brings up all of the original words. This is free and available to you. So you can, you can study the Bible for yourself. So it talks about this idea of entering his rest. So there's the word that I'm looking for. That's it. So I want to see what does this word mean? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click there, and I'm going to see. I like this definition. Calming of winds, a resting place, or a metaphor of, God's, of, of a blessed state where God dwells. So what I'm doing is I'm coming back here and I'm saying rest is calm. And then I've already done the work for you, but this idea of failed to, re failed to reach it is where we get the, the, the word hysteria from, where things are just crazy or out of control and life isn't smooth and things are chaotic and crazy. So then I'll come over here and I'll say calm versus crazy. 
I have both of those attributes in my life. How about you? And then from there, then I'll start diagnosing what areas in my life seem calm and what areas of my life seem crazy. Because if God has a promised rest and I want to reach it, this idea of calm winds or uh, God's blessing or a heavenly realm, how many of you would love that to be ascribed to every area of your life? Nobody wants that? Okay, cool. All right, just checking in. If not, we can just go, just go right to chapter four. <laughs> calm, this idea of being calm in verse... So I would start asking myself, what areas are calm? What areas of crazy? Which brings us to point number one, which would be consistently... Don't skip ahead. Look at Consistently pursue his rest. That's point number one. Consistently pursue his rest because if God has a rest out there that's available to you and I... I want to enter into that rest. And these people who are reading this letter, the Hebrew people would know, they would know that there's this idea of rest that God has mentioned even from the beginning of time. So therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should have seemed to fail to reach it. So there's, there's this idea that there's something available, but yet you and I could maybe not receive it. How many of you want to receive it? If we want to receive it, we have to, again, point number one, we have to consistently, we have to consistently pursue his rest. So this is you and I being intentional about going after the rest that God has available. So for me, I've established a point there in what's being said. So then what I'll do in my Bible is I'll, I'll continue to go down in verse two. So let's open up verse two. Verse two, for good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So then I'm going to start again looking for words that, that stand out to me, okay? So for good news. In the New Testament, what do we know good news to be? The gospel. The gospel is good news. What is the, the gospel? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that we can have an established relationship with God. That's the good news. But the writer is saying here for good news came to us just as it did to them. So then I'm going to ask myself, who is the, who's them that they're talking about? They're, they're talking about the nation of Israel, right? The writer is referring to the nation of Israel. So good news came to us. The gospel came to us. But the gospel or good news actually came to the nation of Israel as well. But what was the gospel to them? The, the gospel was the promised land, Right? God gave them a promise and said, I'm going to bring you into a land that flows with milk and honey, where I'm going to establish you as a nation, where I'm going to be your father, where I'm going to be your God. It's this promised land. That's, that's good news for the nation of Israel. Can we agree? That's good news that there's a promised land. So that's good news for them. But we know that our good news is good news that's found in Jesus. But the message that they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith. What this, is, what this is saying is that the message that they heard was not affected, uh, effective because they did not combine it with their faith. So where it's talking about united by faith, it's, that's our duty or our responsibility to believe in the word that God has spoken. How many of you realize that God has spoken? Okay. It takes our faith to apply what God has spoken. God's word is infallible. It's inspired, it's authoritative, but if you and I don't have faith coupled with God's word, there is no application of that because it takes our faith to activate God's word on our behalf. So let me give you, let, let me give you this example. If God's word is there and it's, act, it, it's alive, it's active, it's inerrant, it's, it's there, but our faith is not coupled with it, it does not activate that. But if we have faith, but it doesn't align with God's word, it still doesn't benefit us. Because you can have all the faith in the world about something, but if it doesn't align with God's word, it doesn't make any difference. Let me give you an example. Some people have faith for things that don't align in God's word. Amen? Like so, Some people believe things or have hope in things or have faith in things and re really just like they're, they're all gung ho about it. Like they're, they're fully a hundred percent. I believe this. They have all the faith in the world for it, but it doesn't align with God's word. That means that it's not true and it's not going to happen. That's a pipe dream. But when our faith along with God's word combines, look, we're not going to miss it. 
and it will actually benefit us when we can take God's word and our faith and combine them together. So good news is a promise from God. So what, what promises from God in his word can you activate your faith in and then see God's work happen in your life? Because this is the wrestle that you and I have as believers, is taking God's word and bringing our level of faith. Remember the person that came to Jesus and said, um, have pity on my faith, uh, but, but, but could, you, could you actually give me more faith? Like, I'm, I'm, in spite of my lack of faith, could, could, you, could you extend to me even more faith? It's this idea of wanting to have more faith in God's promise. And that's exactly what this writer is saying here. For we who have believed entered that rest, okay? So now I'm seeing a word over and over again. So now every time that I hear this idea of rest, I'm gonna start underlining because that's the theme that this writer is trying to talk about. He started and opened up in chapter three, but now he's continuing this thought in chapter four about consistently hitting this idea of rest. Now, side note, rest is not lazy boys and potato chips and back porch and hanging out in the pool. and It's not all that. That, that is restful. But rest, when we're talking biblically, is a person. And his name is Jesus. All, all of our life can be, can be found in rest if we are found in him. So what this writer is pointing to is not a state of relaxation. The writer is pointing to a person named Jesus. And what the writer is continuously hitting over and over again to the Jewish people is you're looking for the promised land. You're looking for physical boundary markers that uh, this place is get, like, we do it all the time. We go on vacation and think of places and then we bring work and all our crazy stuff into a vacation. It's not even a vacation. Then you get home and you need a vacation from the vacation. So it's, it's not a place. What this writer is saying is this place that you guys are so passionate about obtaining is not really a place. It's actually a person. And it's a state of being right with God. That is true rest. Then he goes on and he says, as he has said, so now you see these quotes? The writer is referencing the Old Testament, specifically the book of Psalms around Psalms 95. So David is writing this, but the writer of Hebrews is bringing this up as an illustration. So he's saying, for those who have believed entered his rest, as he said, talking about God's word through, the, through, through uh, David, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter, there's that word again, rest. Although his works were finished. Whose works? God's works. That means God's... The, the only work that's done is done by Christ in the application of our faith. God's working as far as creating and establishing things. It's done. Why? Why do I know that? Although his works were finished from the foundations of the world. So when God founded the world, that was his work. He took the first six days and he worked. And on the seventh day, he rested. He didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because there was nothing else to do. He had already done it all. So he goes on and he says this in verse 4. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, not because he was tired, but because he was completed. And again, in this passage, he said, so again, look, there's the quotations. So he's referencing again, they shall not enter my rest. And then the writer goes back and he says this, since therefore it remains to, uh, for some to enter it, and those who formerly received good news have failed to enter it because of disobedience. Okay, so now I'm starting to see a theme. So now I'm in Hebrews chapter 4, but I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 3, and I'm going to remember right here in verse 16. For those who heard and yet rebelled. And then it goes on, and it says in verse 18, who were disobedient. So what are the, what are the two things that are keeping you and I from rest? our rebellion, and our disobedience. Because the writer is just continuing to compile on this thought that there's a rest made available, but you and I don't enter it because of the two things, rebellion and disobedience, because the writer has mentioned this a couple times. So this is obviously something that's important to the writer. Verse seven, again, he appoints a certain day. So he starts quoting again. Today, saying through, okay, so now we know he's quoting David in the book of Psalms. So long afterwards, in the words already quoted, today, there's the word day, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So this is talking about rebellions, rebelliousness and disobedience again. 
So the writer is talking about this idea that God has said something, right? Good news. So there's good news. Yeah, I got a highlighter. Check it out. So there's good news. It came to us just as to them, but it didn't benefit them because it, was, it, it wasn't united by faith or they didn't have faith in what God was saying. So what are the two things that I need? Well, it takes me to point number two. I need to combine his word and my faith. His word plus my faith equals activation of what the promise is. Amen. And the promise is rest. God is promising you and I as believers that we can have rest. But we don't experience rest because we don't have faith for rest. So even though God has already established an available rest, we don't tap into it because we don't have faith for it. How do I know that? Because the book said so. That's all I need to know. Because the writer has said from... Sorry, I don't want that one. I want that one. The writer has said from there to there that God has this rest that's available for you and I. But we, we don't apply the good news and bring our faith into it so we can't activate it. So what is the writer, again, this is the second time that he's referenced this Old Testament song. So what is the writer saying? Hey, wake up. Don't miss out on God's promise. The good news was preached to them as it is to us. There is a rest available, but it's, all, it's only going to apply when my faith and God's word combine and come together. So we're seven verses in and we're already learning how to get this stuff going. So now let's keep going in verse eight. And again, all of this scribbling and underlining, this is just to help you learn how to get into your Bible. Like, I want you to open up your Bible and read it, underline stuff, and, and this is how you hear from God. Yeah. This is it. You just open his word and see what, what God is saying. So verse 8 says this, For if Joshua, okay, so I'm circling names. And then I'm thinking, okay, so he's talking about Joshua here. Who else has the writer mentioned so far? He's talked about angels. He's talked about prophets. He's talked about Moses. He's talked about Abraham. And now who, who's he talking about? He's talking about Joshua. And Joshua, we know from studying the Bible, is an Old Testament picture of Christ. Why? Because Moses is a picture of the law. Okay, so let me help you right here in this squiggly area. Moses equals law. Joshua equals grace. Moses represents the law to people, but Joshua represents grace because Joshua is an Old Testament representation of Jesus because he takes people from a wilderness wandering into the promised land. Joshua actually, actually leads the nation of Israel into the promised land. But what the writer here is saying is that even though the nation of Israel was in the promised land, God would not have spoken about another day later on for if Joshua had given them rest. But I thought rest was the promised land. That's what the nation of Israel thought. That's what the Hebrew people thought is that rest was a boundary, that it was the promised land that God had pre-established for them. But it's not. Rest is a person. So the writer is reiterating, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken about another day later on. Where is God speaking about another day later on? Right here. How do I know that? Psalms is written by David. The book of Psalm is written by David. Who's older, Joshua or David? Joshua, by a lot. So the writer in Psalm is saying that there is a rest available, but Joshua had already taken them into a promised land. So the writer is saying, Joshua didn't bring them into rest. He brought them into a land. And the people of God are constantly looking for rest in him. And what this writer is saying is rest is not found in a boundary. It's found in a person named Jesus. You can hear him laboring over this point. Like you can hear. He's used almost two chapters now to talk to us about this idea of rest in Jesus. So then there remains a Sabbath rest 
for the people of God. Now, again, the audience who would be receiving this letter would be really familiar with what a Sabbath rest is. How many of you realize Sabbath rest is in God's top 10? Right, the 10 commandments. God says, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. God created everything that we see in six days and on the seventh day, God rested or he had his Sabbath. So he he told the nation of Israel, for you to have the most productivity, I need for you to take one day where you're not working. And again, Sabbathing is something that you and I should practice as followers of Jesus. It's something that we should honor. But again, Jesus came and he taught us that Sabbathing or taking a day off wasn't a religious duty, which the Hebrew people were, were used to. It's actually how we can commune or connect with God through inactivity. Because if you're constantly laboring, that means you're, you're, you're not connecting with God. And this is in God's top 10. So let me give you an example. So I have a Sabbath. I have a day off. And it, I mean, everything goes to hell in a handbasket on the day that I take off. I mean, everything goes crazy. Like I get calls and like, it's just insane on the day that anybody else like that, you try to take a day off, you try to go on vacation. It's like, or not, you know, things just get wild. And it happens to me every time. And somebody will call me and say, Hey, Pastor Chad, I I have a question. I I know you're, I know you're, uh, uh, well, what are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing nothing. And they're like, oh, great. Well, I need you to do something. I got this question, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, you didn't hear me. I said, I'm doing, I'm doing nothing. I'm, do, I'm doing, that's what I'm actively doing. Like I'm actively doing nothing. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll get you back. Let me give you an example. Think about your job and your profession, whatever you do. How easy would it be for you if I called you on your day off and I said, hey, what are you doing? And you said, nothing. And I said, well, I have a question and it's kind of work related. Can I ask you? Oh yeah, I got a couple minutes. You'd have no problem saying that. True, true or untrue? Liars. You'd have, no, you'd have no problem saying, yeah, I got a couple minutes. I got a couple minutes. You'd have no problem saying that. You wouldn't feel bad about it. Wouldn't feel grieved about it. No problem at all. Now let me ask you, this is in God's top 10. What else is in God's top 10? If I called you and I said, hey, I was just wondering, you want to get drunk later and go cheat on our spouses? What would you say? You wouldn't say, oh yeah, I got a minute for that later on this day. Later on in the season, I got, I got a couple spare minutes. No, you wouldn't. Now, that's a little drastic comparison. Is it? Is it? Because it's, it's, it's in God's top 10. And if God was serious enough about the Sabbath to put it in the top 10, how many of you think that that'd be important for you and I to recognize and to put emphasis and focus on? So I want to ask you in, seventh day, in seven days, what day are you taking off where you are unplugged from your work? You know, you can honor God by taking a day off. And I'm not saying this. You, you can be active it, like taking a Sabbath isn't inactivity. It's just you're not doing productive work that provides you some kind of an income. But, but you're specifically taking a day off to connect and to recharge spiritually. It's important. It's in God's top 10. Give them rest. Talking about this idea of a Sabbath day. Verse 10. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work. So, okay. So God's rest. His works. This is talking about us. This is talking about God. Whoever has entered into God's rest has rested. So this shows me right here. Whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works. So if I'm working, I'm not in God's rest. So if I want God's rest, what do I have to do? I have to stop working. Not, not, not just working like job-wise, but I'm talking about working to earn your salvation, working to keep your salvation, striving, trying, earning your great place with God. Not gonna do it. You wanna know why? Because God has already entered into a great place with God on your behalf. So what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say is that you will never enter into God's rest by your work and your labor. No one will ever say to God, well, I've worked so hard that I've entered into a place where I can be right with you. Nobody. Nobody will ever be able to say that. So when we rest from our work, we can actually experience God's rest as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So there's that word disobedience again, but I'm having a problem here. Because this word and this word are completely opposite. 
strive, and rest, they have nothing in common together. Think about the word strive. What does that speak to? Energy, effort, momentum, doing, activity, strive, rest. What does rest say? Relaxed, calm, just experiencing. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is let us therefore strive to enter into rest, okay? So that takes me to point number three. I have to contend to enter into his rest. The word contend talks about actively pursuing or passionately going after. The reason that you and I have to passionately pursue God's rest is because everything will try to come in between it. When you try to take a Sabbath, when you try to take a day off, when you try to experience time with God, you, you try. If, if you don't read the Bible every day, try to read the Bible. Everything will try to get in the way of it. If you don't pray every day and have a specific time where you pray, try to set it up and see if everything does. You, nobody will, you will, you'll say, you know what, I'm gonna pray on my way to work. And you're on your way to work at 7.30. Nobody calls you, nobody interrupts you. It's like, on your first day of trying, somebody's gonna call you at 7.30. Hey, what are you doing this morning? You and I have to contend. This is a combative term, which means that we have, to, we have to fight things that would try to keep us from resting with God. What are things that try to fight us from resting with God? Religiosity. Religion and rules, and regulations. Us trying and striving. That will keep you from resting. Why? Because it has you in a cyclical pattern of trying to earn. You're just constantly trying to earn. You have to contend for whose rest? For God's rest. So we have to strive so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So the writer is saying that we can, we can actually be disobedient just like the nation of Israel because they relied on themselves. They were rebellious. They were disobedient. So the writer goes from there and then he goes to this idea about talking about the word of God. And this is, this is spoken a lot, talking about the word of God being the Bible, which is accurate and it's true because this word right here, word of God, speaks to logos, which is the original word. So if I were to go back to that free website where it shows you all the original words, the word of God is logos, which is the written word. But look at what's being said here. God spoke. Okay, so God's speaking. Okay, let's see. Good news came to, okay, so again, here is God speaking. So God is speaking, and the writer is giving examples of how God is speaking over and over again in the Old Testament, and now he's speaking to us in the New Testament, but he says this, for the word of God is living and active. So if it's living and active, I always think about opposite words. The opposite of living is dead. The opposite of active is inactive. So the word of God is alive today. And how do I know the word of God is alive today? Because the Holy Spirit's speaking to you through his word. That's how it's alive. This is the only book that when you read it, it will read you back. So it's living and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So when I think about a sword, you can either slice with a sword or you can penetrate with a sword. So what the writer is saying here is that the word of God can actually penetrate your heart. But not only that, but when it gets in there, it can actually slice on both sides. It's a, it's a double-edged sword. The word of God, the, the spoken word of God. Okay, so let's compare this. The word of God, which would be the good news in the Old Testament, was I'm going to take you into a land of promise. So that promise was alive and active and it could have penetrated their heart and divided. What would it have divided? It would have divided their Egypt slavery thoughts and their promised believing in God thoughts. That's what, that's what the word of God would have done. If they would have believed the word of God, it would have, it would have pierced their heart. They would have believed. So what does the word of God do for us today? It pierces us with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus, and then it gets in there and it messes you all up. That's what God's word, I mean, it, God's word, frustrates me every time I read it because it reads me and I'm not good. There is nothing good in me. And you wanna know how I know it? This is my favorite part about God's word. Check this out. There's that word piercing again. To the division of soul and spirit. So just to give you an idea really quick, um, 
Theologists have this idea when they study how we're created. Um, it's dichotomy or trichotomy is the thought. So dichotomy, are we made in two? Trichotomy, made in three. For me, I'm a trichotomist because I believe God's three and spirit, soul, and body. That's just my thought, but we can have donuts with dad after if you want to argue about it. We can talk about it, whatever. It's not a big deal, not a primary issue, so I'm not concerned. But the word of God divides soul and spirit. What, what, is, what is your soul? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. What is your spirit? Your spirit is what connects you to God. So the word of God will divide. It will get your emotions out of things. Do you want to be a God decision maker or a you decision maker? When I'm a me decision maker, it's not good. But when I'm a God decision maker, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I need to hear God's word and I need to make God-sized decisions. I need God's word on some things. How do I know that it's God's word and not mine? Well, because the word of God is the only thing that will separate my soul and my spirit. It's the only thing that will do it. And then notice that it goes on, it says, uh, joints and marrow. So it's talking about this idea. And then here's my favorite part of this verse, because this is the one that really, this one frustrates me. The thoughts, ooh, this one hurts already. I'm just gonna go ahead and highlight that for you because you should. Thoughts and intentions of the heart. We know from Jeremiah that the heart is de desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible, the word of God is the only thing that can separate your thoughts and the intentions of your heart because you will lie to yourself all day about what you think and why you handled something the way that you did. You're a liar and you lie to yourself. You tell yourself, oh, well, I did this because of that or I did it because I love them or I did that because of this and this is why I did that. And uh, you go to apologize. Well, the reason I did that and the reason I did this and the reason I did that, blah, 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 blah. You start blame shifting. It's what they did in the garden. And it's what you and I do. And we lie to ourselves all day our thoughts and intentions. Well, the reason that I did, we, we start coming up with these intentions of why we did this. Blah, blah, blah. We, we lie to ourselves, And the only thing that can expose our heart, our thoughts and the intentions is God's word. So when you take a situation and you bear it before God's word and you said, all right, God, why did, not only what did I do, but why did I do that? And then God reveals it to you. And you're like, oh, that wasn't me. That word is called conviction. Amen. And conviction is when God uses her, his word to trump your opinion, your thought, and your emotions and what you think about yourself. Because you are your favorite person. So that brings me to point number four. Is I need to concede to his word. I need to concede to his word. Why? Why? Again, the Bible says very clearly, no creature, wrong thing, no creature is hidden from God's sight. All of us are naked and exposed to the eyes of him. Ooh, I don't like that part either. This is what I sound like every time I read the Bible. Ooh, I don't like that part. You're getting an insider perspective on what a pastor thinks when he, re ooh, I don't like that part. Because I know you say the same thing. Because I do. Right here, naked and exposed. Who was naked and exposed that we know of? In the garden, Adam and Eve. Right? Be and, and then what did they do? They, they lied. Oh, well, you know, God, we, we, were, we, were, we were hiding because we were naked. and shit. Well, who told you that? Again, it's God's word revealing to them. God's word revealed to them that they were trying. And what was, what was Adam and Eve's intention behind a leaf? Remember the Bible says that Adam and Eve found a leaf and they covered themselves. Well, that's their thought and their intention because they were, they were covering it. That's their thought and their intention. And what, what did God say? Uh, that covering that you have, that thought and that, that intention that you have, that's not gonna do it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to provide a sacrifice to cover your thought and your intention because your thought and intention is bad. So God said, I'll take an innocent animal and I'll kill it and I'll take it and I'll cover what you tried to do with your thoughts and intention. God, God doesn't need your thoughts and he doesn't need your intention. Can I just help you out? God does not need any more decision makers. God needs hearers. And the word of God helps us learn how to be hearers. We're not decision makers. We don't need to trust our heart. We don't need to think about our intentions. No, no, no. 
We need to take our thoughts and, inten- and, and intentions and we need to submit them to God's word. So what does that look like? It looks simply like this and you can apply it just like this by saying, you know what, you're really frustrating me right now. So what I need to do is I need to not talk to you. I need 24 hours. That would save marriages and friendships because you, you're frustrating me. What you did, how you hurt me, this th- stuff at work. Because if not, you're gonna give them your thoughts and then you're gonna try to explain to them your intentions. How has that worked out for you so far? I don't know about you, but it doesn't work out very great for me. So what I do is I just nicely ask people, hey, can I talk to you about that tomorrow? Why? Not because I need a night to think about, I need a night to get in God's word. And I need God to show me, what do I really need to say in this situation? What really needs to happen in this situation? So we just did a Bible study together. I just showed you what I do in my Bible study. So when I get done with the Bible study, then, then comes the application piece. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna apply this together, okay? And we apply this through prayer. So do me a favor, would you stand with me?